On the 19th of June 1948, on what would have been his 39th birthday, the author Usamu Dazai was found in the Tamagawa Canal in Tokyo, having drowned in a double suicide alongside his mistress, Tomi Yamazaki, six days prior. It was his fifth attempt at killing himself. His most famous work, and what is reportedly the second best-selling novel of all time in Japan, No Longer Human, Ningen Shikaku, had been published only a month or so beforehand. As irony would have it, Dazai was working on an unfinished manuscript during the time of his death, under the working title of Goodbye. LOL. I mean, I'm not being funny, but that title is shit. <laughs> It's no fucking wonder he killed himself. Anyway, Usamu Dazai's life story itself should serve as the spoiler alert when it comes to his magnum opus, and since I'm going to be diving into its waters very shortly, I would advise anyone who wishes to read this novel to do so before continuing with this video. Thank you. Arigato. I wish I could say that it's good to be back, but well, here we are regardless. Before we delve into the utterly fucking depressing and bleak world of post-war Japan and Obayozo, however, I think I'd be remiss not to mention the positives and sheer humanity that has arisen due to this heartbreaking and uncomfortably relatable book. Whilst until relatively recently its fame has remained within the archipelago that makes up Japan, No Longer Human has been adapted possibly more times than any other novel I've ever come across, especially within the proportion of time since its mid-20th century publication. To this day, even, fans visit his grave every year to leave flowers and pay their respects. As of this video, there are two movie adaptations, one of which was released on the 100th anniversary of Dazai's birth, the other a sci-fi anime feature film called Human Lost, placing the piece in the year 2036. In the world of manga, four adaptations have been produced, one of which was created by Yasunori Ninose, who chose to depict the negative emotions of human beings and their sexual practices via the illustrations of tentacles. Yes, tentacles. And believe it or not, there's plenty of simp dollars to be had in the subterranean corner of this pornographic marketplace. Just ask Belle Dauphine. <laughs> Apparently, by the manga artist Ninose-chan's own admission, they've been a kink of his since he was five years old. The less said about that, I think we can all agree, the better. Moving on, and last but not least, two anime adaptations have been heavily, if not directly, influenced by No Longer Human. Bungao Stray Dogs, for instance, features a character called Dazai, who is obsessed with killing himself, but ultimately always fails. Again, lol. For the majority of this video, however, I shall be featuring stills from the recently released manga version by Junji Ito, because, like him, 
I also like to make my audience feel as uncomfortable as possible. And the 2009 anime series Aoi Bongaku. For those of you who may be interested, the company behind this particular anime version, Madhouse Inc., are also responsible for the Sublime Death Note series and the film Perfect Blue, which is quite frankly one of the most unnerving films I've ever seen. And, not gonna lie, the chick in it is hot as fuck. The film might be hard to watch at times, but she springs up a whole different kind of hard. Am I right, boys? <coughs> oh, oh, oh. <coughs> in fact, I'm sure that's why the film is called Perfect Blue. It's talking about your balls after watching it. <laughs> <coughs> However, I am speaking first and foremost about the source material that is the novel. And whilst I recommend checking out as many of the adaptations as you please, the book is always bare to burr. So yeah, just like read it first. Seriously, the two I feature here are the best, but none are on the same level as the novel. The Japanese characterise books such as No Longer Human as eye novels. As suggested, an eye novel is usually told in first person, understood to have been based around the experiences of its author, with a little legroom for fictionalisation. However, the quote-slash-unquote facts of the story are neither what's important, nor are they meant to be what the focus is on. As readers, it is the emotional state of our protagonist that should serve as the novel's point of interest. The Western equivalent would be what the French call a roman en clé, a novel with a key. The key being the understanding between author and reader that the novel itself is a thinly veiled facade, a depiction of real life people and the events which surrounded them only with made up names. Sylvia Plath's Esther Greenwood in her suicide, uh, sorry, novel, The Bell Jar, serves as a good example. If you ask me, this is true of any literature worth its salt, but going by my own book sales, I might be wrong. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into the novel. Published in 1948, No Longer Human is a novel told in the epistolary format. For the unacquainted, this simply means that the story is told in a series of documents. Whilst usually in letter format, like Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, diary entries or newspaper articles can also be used, as well as notebooks, as Dazai opted for with No Longer Human. The epistolary style has the benefit of omitting any need for a narrator, since the stories they tell are put together by whomever gathered the documents. An outsider, much like you as the reader, presents its contents for inspection. In some sense, it gives the impression of sneaking a look into someone's diary, in hope of finding the juiciest shit our gutter brains can ever hope to imagine. Though in our case, and in the context of No Longer Human, we know nothing of the person who wrote the notebooks, and therefore have no motivation to read their contents. Dazai deals with this by making his collector of the documents as intrigued as he'd like his reader to be, but by using three old photographs as his point of reference instead of any writings, cleverly setting up the first of the three notebooks by describing our main character as a child. Indeed, the more carefully you examine the child's smiling face, the more you feel an indescribable, unspeakable horror creeping over you. You see that it is actually not a smiling face at all. The boy has not a suggestion of a smile. Look at his tightly clenched fists if you want proof. No human being can smile with his fists doubled like that. It is a monkey. A grinning monkey face.
After roasting the picture of a child, the narrator of the prologue then goes on to describe two other photographs, one of our MC during his teenage years, and the final one as an adult. Whilst conceding that our protagonist grows up to be a devilishly handsome young man, he continues his ad hominem character assassination, using his baffling appearance to prompt the reader into asking, what could make a person look like that? Keeping in line with the inhuman element, this cleverly foreshadows the structure of the notebooks we're about to read as well, forewarning the reader of the nihilism we're soon to encounter. Abandon or hope, ye who enter this place, springs to mind, if only in the abstract. Going by the prologue then, it is rather difficult to refute Junji Ito's assertions when it comes to the novel, despite how convenient I initially found his insights to be. I mean, come on, just look at a sample of his work. A pencil sharpener would be seen as a potential device of torture to this man. Though I suppose, to the man with the unfortunate possession of a micropenis, it is. Then again, the author of this video sees existence as a horror show within itself. So I guess Junji and I are simpatico on that front. As a child, I had absolutely no notion of what others, even members of my own family, might be suffering or what they were thinking. I was aware only of my own unspeakable fears and embarrassments. Before anyone realised it, I had become an accomplished clown, a child who never spoke a single truthful word. From an appallingly young age, Yozo decides to play the fool in order to please others, prompted by his inability to understand anyone around him. By his logic, he is able to subdue any suspicions of his own strangeness, so long as the others never see him for what he truly is. He mentions confusions as to how the adults around him operate, questions their contradictory natures, and professes to never even have known what it's like to feel hunger. Dazai himself was no stranger to European literature. I'd wager that he was stepping in where Kafka left off, echoing the same sentiments of the short story A Hunger Artist. In its closing passage, the nameless protagonist insists that he should receive no admiration for the efforts of his fasting, confessing that the only reason he was able to starve himself for so long was simply because he never found any food that he liked, his lack of appetite thus displaying his lack of taste for life itself. Back in post-war Japan, and in Yozo's case, this could be indicative of his well-to-do background, exemplary of the supposed privileges he was born into. But be that as it may, the flip side of such admissions seems to suggest the severest form of neglect. Instead of ever being asked how he feels about anything, or receiving the slightest encouragement to do so from the others around him, Yozo is told how he feels, even gaslighted to some extent, never being in want of food because of how frequently it was shoved into his face, which he would eat simply to please. In possession of a sensitive disposition, along with the vulnerability that comes with being a child, Yozo complies and quickly learns to be agreeable, opting for the mask of a clown just to get by without ever truly being seen. The true tragedy of this decision is marked by one of the only exchanges Yozo has with his father. As was his custom, Yozo's father enjoyed bringing back gifts from his work travels and would often ask the children what they would like before he packed his bags once again. Not unironically, 
After Yozo shrugs with indifference to the offer, his father suggests a mask, knowing that they now have some available in children's sizes. Not really wanting it, but unable to say so, Yozo's brother, taking his cue from Yozo's silent indecisiveness, suggests a book instead, only for Yozo to confront the disappointment in his father's eyes as he jots down his preferred present inside his notebook. Riddled with guilt, Yozo spends the night tossing and turning until finally sneaking into his parents' room and writing inside his father's notebook that he'd instead prefer the mask originally offered, despite him not really wanting anything from him, except, perhaps, an actual father. The dramatic irony here cannot be understated. Only a few paragraphs prior, Yozo makes mention of how he became a clown and the reasons for it, only to demonstrably showcase his reasons via his actions. Did he then opt to be a clown? Or did he feel pushed into it by his difficult to please, unobservant father? It also suggests that Yozo, or perhaps Dazai, considering how often No Longer Human has been taken for a suicide note from its author by many a literary critic, can only ever communicate with his father via the written word, thus foreshadowing not only Yozo's future artistic aspirations in some sense, but also the unmendable and never-to-be-addressed flaw between him and his father. As the novel progresses, so does the distance between them, their messages to one another even passed along by a third party. To top this all off, Yozo drops further heartbreak onto the page by confessing that the maids and manservants entrusted to care and nurture him whilst his politician of a father was away subjected him to sexual abuse. The sinister side of me believes they did so not only out of illicit desire but also resentment for his parents' social status, perhaps sensing how they really didn't know a thing about their children whatsoever and thus took advantage. And naturally, Yozo's self-appointed role of clown was only strengthened by this abuse, fearing that the boy he pretended to be for the parents he could not understand would simply not believe him, were he ever to tell them. For why would they? He was always such a mischievous and fun-loving child, forever playing pranks and clowning around. Right? I did warn you that this book is fucking depressing, didn't I? Unfortunately for Yozo, and despite his best efforts, his horseplay inevitably fails to deceive everyone. After goofing around at school one time during physical ed, Takeshi, an ugly kid with no redeeming features who borders on the retarded, Yozo's words, confronts him, accusing Yozo of fraudulence. Being caught in his duplicitousness by the normally unnoticed Takeshi freaks Yozo out so much that he actively seeks to befriend the boy solely to make sure he keeps his mouth shut. Again, the irony is wrought throughout these memorandums, provided we take Yozo for his word. Is he really so determined to keep his counterfeit character intact? Or is his horror at being caught out, in fact, of a slight relief? Despite thinking of Takeshi as a half-wit, he's eventually shown some artwork by his new friend, a self-portrait of Van Gogh, which inspires Yozo to show him a volume of Modigliani paintings. This eventually leads Yozo into painting himself, the results of which he only ever shows Takeshi, which again demonstrates Yozo's contradictory ways. His lack of self-awareness is particularly strong in this instance, considering how the self-portraits he paints horrify him to the extreme. It appears he finally looks through the clown makeup to discover the monster buried beneath. 
In the Aoi Bungaku series, Yozo eventually becomes haunted by this true self, where I believe the similarities between his phantom and the paintings of Modigliani are pretty hard to deny. Yozo also opts to hide these images from the girls in his life at all costs, shit scared at what impression they might leave. Once more, the next stage of the piece is set. Before we know it, Yozo is old enough for college, Takeshi is forgotten like the forgettable son of a bitch Yozo told us he was before, and is replaced by the better looking but equally disagreeable scallywag Huriki who waltzes in to teach our anti-hero all about women and wine, so long as Yozo fronts the cost of both. Before long, Yozo is drowning himself in all things liquor, poured by the nameless females of the brothels he regularly frequents. While censorship had been alleviated during this era of post-war Japan, This by no means made Dazai's admissions any the less shocking, since the compatriots of his audience had neither ever confronted such based honesty, nor such debauched nihilism. Well, from a literature point of view, anyhow. The embracing of such harlotry quickly leads Yozo into the deep end of poverty, during which he joins a secret Marxist group, more for entertainment purposes or as a middle finger to his father, perhaps, than from any political leanings. I'll touch more on the Socialist Party tomfoolery a little later on, but it is interesting to note how Yozo, despite coming from a well-to-do background, finds himself struggling against circumstances during this period. Whether the correlation is purely speculative or not, the sting of being poor cannot be understated. Here, Yozo meets a woman in similar circumstances, the wife of a criminal who's currently in prison, Suneko. When with her, perhaps for the first time, Yozo drops his mask and allows the equally depressed and downtrodden Suneko to see him for how he truly is. Before long, they decide to commit suicide together. Interestingly enough, This is merely briefed over in the novel, barely mentioned, and only so in the absolute. In both the adaptations of Madhouse Inc. and Junji Ito, however, we are taken down the coast with Yozo and Suneko, and witness the events as they unfold. In both of these versions, Yozo not only dives into the water last, but shoves Suneko into the water as well. Fellow YouTuber Jiffy in his excellent video exploring the bleak world of No Longer Human, made some criticism of this choice, stating that it is an odd and essentially incorrect one. Initially, much like I just mentioned, I agree with his take. The book barely covers this first attempt at double suicide. It is mentioned almost as if in passing. However, Jiffy goes on to say that the decision to make Yozo a clear-cut murderer is a bad one, and affects how you view him from that point onwards, ultimately shifting the narrative via your new perception of Yozo. Whilst I agree with this on the surface level, I'd like to counter his argument with the following. Now, let's step into Yozo's shoes for a moment. Or whatever the fuck those things are meant to be. I mean, it's no surprise Japan invited so much influence from the West if they forced their own citizens to wear some mishmash of sandals and flip-flops. Anyway, let's imagine. You find yourself poorer than you ever have been. Your whole life has been one horror show after another, and you're at your lowest point yet. Then, you meet a member of the opposite sex. In this case, a woman. Finally, you think to yourself, you found someone who sees the world and all its bleakness as if through the same eyes as your own. For the first time, you can let your guard down and allow the mask you've been wearing for so long to fall. 
Before long, after sharing intimate, secret beliefs about the state of things, you arrive at the conclusion that this life is not worth living. Together, you decide to bow out of existence. Regardless of how, you each take the plummet, but to your further despair and continued terror. Instead of returning to the nothingness of which you came, you wake up only to find that your partner in suicide succeeded where you failed. The more I've thought about this, the less I've been truly able to comprehend what it might do to a person. Not only would you have to deal with the shame of attempting suicide and failing, but it would also be coupled by what I can only think of as survivor's guilt. And through the eyes of society, which is later pondered over by Yozo in quite thorough detail, you are not only guilty of attempting suicide, but also as an accessory to the death of somebody else. In essence, whatever innocence you may indeed possess simply does not matter. In society's eyes, you are a murderer. Whether guilty or innocent is entirely redundant. I liken it to waking up one day to discover that the whole world knows you by a name other than your own. And no matter how much you try to insist that your name is not the one that they think it is, it makes no difference at all. That's what the world thinks it is, so it may as well be so. I believe that's potentially why both the adaptations opted to make Yozo culpable. In a sense, he was acting on the behalf of a society that would later come to see him as a murderer, no matter what. They say that the worst punishment a man can suffer isn't death, but exile. To be shunned from your fellow people and banned from them entirely. Or as the literal translation of the book, Ningin Chikaku, suggests, disqualified as a human being. In Yozo's case, his is a version of the Kafkaesque and clandestine. A silent, unenforced exile. I, for one, cannot decide which of the two is worse. Nor can I even imagine what it must have been like for the author. Introducing Flatfish, LOL. After receiving news that his family are utterly disgusted by his actions and have all but disowned him, Yozo is cleared after an investigation and calls one of his father's old friends, known only as Flatfish because of his looks, to bail him out. Before long, Flatfish is paid to quote unquote look after Yozo and make sure he doesn't get any funny ideas about killing himself again. <laughs> He's expelled from his studies due to the incident and Flatfish prohibits him from leaving the house. In my view, this was Dazai employing a degree of ironical humour into the novel, which, due to its macabre nature, is easily overlooked. It almost even mirrors Yozo's position now, for when we think of a fish flattened out, its association is surely that with death. And much like Yozo, plucked out of the water while still alive, it could also be seen as to represent what his son now is to his father, in a sort of passive-aggressive form of Schrodinger's cat Yozo is now both dead and alive inside his father's eyes.
Some theories do suggest tragedy being the echo behind all forms of laughter, after all. Also, this constant monitoring and surveillance of Yozo is again a lot like something out of a Kafka novel. Yozo is guilty because those surrounding him tell him that he is. <laughs> it isn't long before the lack of alcohol and cigarettes, not to mention any freedom whatsoever, gets the better of Yozo and he makes his escape. Knowing only Horiki, he goes in search of his supposed friend. Through him, he meets Shizuko, who, smitten with Yozo upon first sight, soon has him living with her and her five-year-old daughter, Shigeko. Due to connections, Yozo begins work as a cartoonist, and although of low repute, he makes a fairly decent living for a while, and lives the life of a kept man, playing father to a child lacking one of her own, perhaps even becoming, for a short period at least, the one he too never had. That is, until Shigeko confesses to wanting nothing more than her own real daddy back, which depresses Yozo beyond measure. I felt dizzy with the shock. An enemy... Was I Shigeko's enemy? Or was she mine? He was another frightening grown-up who would intimidate me. A stranger. An incomprehensible stranger. A stranger full of secrets. Shigeko's face suddenly began to look that way. I had been deluding myself with the belief that Shigeko at least was safe but she too was like the ox which suddenly lashes out with its tail to kill the horsefly on its flank. I knew that from then on I would have to be timid even before that little girl. When you consider that he is talking about a five-year-old girl, this observation from Yozo is both hilarious and brutally sad. Lost and alone despite his surroundings, Yozo quickly descends into debauchery once again, pawning Shizuko's clothes when he's hard up for cash to buy cheap, strong liquor. Like many an addict's descent into their despair, coupled with his deeply held beliefs regarding human beings and his relationship with them, makes Yozo's actions, be they conscious or otherwise, only serve to reinforce and confirm his suspicions. It is by no mistake that when he witnesses Shizuko and her daughter from afar later on, seeing how their bondage is heightened during his absence, he abandons them without so much as a word. And once again, Yozo makes little other note of this in terms of, say, a plot point. The small glimpse into what he perceives as the world without him is enough for Yozo to disappear from the people in his life altogether, like a ghost or corpse of a living human being, as Yozo comes to suspect Hariki of believing him to be, mentioned later on in the final notebook. Society. I felt as though even I were beginning at last to acquire some vague notion of what it meant. It is the struggle between one individual and another, a then and there struggle, in which the immediate triumph is everything. Human beings never submit to human beings. Even slaves practice their mean retaliations. Human beings cannot conceive of any means of survival except in terms of a single then and there contest. They speak of duty to one's country and such like things, but the object of their efforts is invariably the individual, and, even once the individual's needs have been met, again the individual comes in. The incomprehensibility of society is the incomprehensibility of the individual. The ocean is not society, it is individuals. This was how I managed to gain a modicum of freedom from my terror at the illusion of the ocean called the world. 
During the next episode of Yozo's life, he shacks up with the madam of a bar and drowns himself in liquor once again. In the same fashion as he did just before attempting the double suicide. Whilst his later ruminations, which include the mentioning of Dostoevsky's crime and punishment, are not far from the horizon, Yozo's descent into a sick, spiteful man appeared to be an almost direct homage to Dostoevsky's unnamed narrator in Notes from Underground. Yozo's arrival at the conclusion that the incomprehensibility of society is the incomprehensibility of the individual are even the exact sentiments, or at least same notions, of the Russian's most controversial piece, which he wrote in reaction to the rising Enlightenment era, which proclaimed itself to be the new era of human progressivism, where religion would be left behind in order for science to progress. What both Dostoevsky and Dazai point out, however, is that the ideological outlook of both the Enlightenment and the Socialist Party Yozo finds himself a member of both fail, irrevocably, to take human folly into account. The seething rage found in the equally plotless Notes from Underground is in direct attack at this failure, or perhaps even deliberately overlooked truth, when it comes to all forms of ideological thinking. Human beings as studies have testified innumerably since this time period began, are simply not the rational creatures they deludedly believe and proclaim themselves to be. In contrary to the further despair that this would presumably bring about in Yozo, despite his sliding into the pits of addiction, actually provide him some solace when it comes to dealing with human beings and all their incomprehensibility. As the motivational speaker and happy-go-lucky Arthur Schopenhauer also once observed, if every desire was satisfied as soon as it arose, how would men occupy their lives? How would they pass the time? Imagine this race transported to a utopia where everything grows of its own accord and turkeys fly around ready roasted, where lovers find one another without any delay and keep one another without any difficulty. In such a place, some men would die of boredom or hang themselves. Some would fight and kill one another. And thus, they would create for themselves more suffering than nature inflicts on them as it is. Kind of gives the phrase, misery loves company, an entirely different implication when you really think about it. Luckily for us, and even more so Yozo, His grief is soon to be relieved, if only for a brief respite, by the innocent and therefore naive 17-year-old Yoshiko, whose virginal condition and genius ability to trust entices Yozo into marrying her. Whilst modern sensibilities would most likely reproach Yozo for his insights regarding her purity, It is by no mistake that Yozo meets a young woman whose innocence equals that of an even younger person. As the prescient Yozo notes, all is a setup for further tragedy and sorrow, to be cruelly delivered in a reflective fashion of Yozo's own past. In fact, The sweet life Yozo unearths barely finds itself able to last much more than a stanza. I gave up drink and devoted my energies to drawing cartoons. After dinner we would go out together to see a movie, and on the way back we would stop at a milk bar or buy pots of flowers. But more than any of these things, it gave me pleasure just to listen to the words or watch the movements of my little bride who trusted in me with all her heart. Then, just when I had begun to entertain faintly in my breast the sweet notion that perhaps there was a chance I might turn one of these days into a human being and be spared the necessity of a horrible death, Hariki showed up again. To add a sense of foreboding via the seemingly trivial, it's during a conversation between Hariki and Yozo 
where they're discussing the antonyms of proposed words and where crime and punishment is mentioned. That Yozo is presented with a crime taking place under his very own roof, which Hariki, in all his repugnant glee and schadenfreudian demeanour, after a tellingly brief departure, returns to the roof in which he and Yozo were sat drinking and drags him downstairs, his colour and voice having notably changed. Look, he whispers at the top of the staircase, pointing as if through the window of a brothel, to where Yushiko is being raped by the runt of a shopkeeper, whom had previously lay claim to be interested in purchasing one of Yozo's cartoon strips. Now, some would be eager to criticise Yozo for his complete lack of action here. He does nothing to aid Yoshiko or put an end to what is happening. Instead, all Yozo does is run back from where he came, finally descending into a state beyond all redemption. His decision to not do anything to help Yoshiko is a telling one, though. One part of me believes it's due to the abuse that he suffered as a child, especially given Yoshiko's naive and frankly childlike mindset, mirroring that of his own at the time it occurred. Another, however, is put into doubt when Hariki advises Yozo to learn his lesson and forgive Yoshiko, seeing that he is no prize himself either. Hariki's misogyny notwithstanding, it is still difficult to interpret the intended meaning behind his departing words. If Yoshiko were being raped, as Yozo later laments, why didn't Hariki attempt to save her himself, instead of returning to the rooftop and displaying the crime to Yozo? By advising him to learn his lesson, he also seems to imply an element of the consensual to the act, regardless of Yozo's later sentiments mentioning the incident, where he and his new bride are both left to rot. Even after Hariki leaves, Yoshiko, serving the plate of beans she was originally summoned to retrieve, says, He told me he wouldn't do anything. To which Yozo tags no adjective. He told me he wouldn't do anything, neither implies consent nor its antonym, adding a sense of cognitive dissonance in the reader whilst indicating the approaching tidal wave of paranoia and irremediable despair. Considering the era, it is my suspicion that the incident lent more on that of a crime than that of a sin. But since Yozo even goes on himself to ask, is trustfulness a sin? It is difficult to find any conclusive interpretation. Once again though, I believe Dazai's point, whose wife in real life committed adultery whilst he was hospitalised, rather than that of Yozo's, is to mark how, regardless of the quote-unquote truth of the incident, the damage inflicted would essentially always be the same. The very innocence and, quote, immaculate trustfulness that became the virtue Yozo depended on is even called into question here, making the blunt confessional absolutisms of the novel itself harbour into the realm of the unreliable. Since it is, of course, entirely possible that Yozo's view of Yoshiko was merely a projection of the youth he once had and lost, potentially a mask, which he himself adorns once again in the futile hope of overlooking the glaring downfall of their relationship as it capitulates. After all, the immaculate trustfulness of which he questions to be sinful could very well be Yoshiko's or the faith he had in her to begin with. It isn't long before Yozo attempts, 
and fails once again to end his life via an overdose of sleeping pills of which he previously scratched off the Japanese or Kana, if you will, knowing that Yoshiko had no understanding of the Western, presumably English writing he left unmarked. Discharged from hospital once again by good old Flatfish, Yozo quickly finds his alcoholism transgress into a morphine addiction. After entering an ugly affair with the crippled pharmacy girl, whom he easily seduces and manipulates into giving him bigger and bigger doses, Yozo writes to his father to relay his circumstances and substantial, ever-accumulating debt at the chemist. Afterwards, he again decides to end his life but is thwarted by Hariki and Flatfish, as if they somehow intuitively sniffed out his intentions. They have him put in a sanatorium, to which Yozo concludes is his exile from humanity in all its fatality. And now I had become a madman. Even if released... I would be forever branded on the forehead with the word madman, or perhaps reject, disqualified as a human being. I had now ceased utterly to be a human being. During the remainder of his three-month stay and supposed recovery, Yozo learns through his brother that his father only a month or so prior to his departure from the mental institution, has died. He's told he will not have to worry regarding any financial concerns, so long as he agrees to leave Tokyo at once. His exile complete, an elderly woman is sent to look after, and presumably over, Yozo. Three years pass. The third notebook closes with Yozo mistakenly taking laxatives instead of sleeping pills, closing the epistolary tale with its anti-hero shitting himself. LOL. There is an argument to be made here that Yozo's continued existence from here on out is actually worse than him dying. Ostracised in his totality, exiled from family, home, and all of those he once knew, we leave him alone as the ghost of himself that he's become. The unnamed neutral narrator from the opening passages of the novel returns to bookend the piece with an epilogue. It is here that we learn, of course, that he is a writer. As fate would have it, we discover that he used to go to the same bar that Yozo once frequented in Kyobayashi. During a visit to a friend, a decade later, he bumps into the madam who ran the bar. It is through her that he acquires the notebooks and photographs. After mentioning how he would have had Yozo committed himself if he were his friend, revealing his own bias when it comes to the commentary of his prologue, the madam counters his impressions by blaming Yozo's father for what he became, dismissing even his troubles with alcohol, describing Yozo as laid back and funny, a good boy and an angel. Yozo's self-loathing and self-deprecating throughout the entire piece is thus put into question. A monster perhaps in his own eyes, but to others, an angel? Dazai's genius and willingness to remove the self-autobiographical element of the novel is no accident. By suggesting that other people saw Yozo entirely differently than he saw himself, we, as the reader, are also led to question our own judgment of him, which we have been doubtlessly making during the entire read.
My initial intention with this essay was to answer the question as to whether or not No Longer Human is in fact a suicide note. Whilst I still do not believe it is overall, my conclusion in the end is that it simply does not matter. Osamu Dazai's real name was Suji Tsushima. So for anyone to make the point that No Longer Human is Dazai's suicide note, should take it into consideration that Oba Yozo is a fictionalized character of the persona that was Usamu Dazai, who was the pseudonym of Suji Tsushima. As human beings, we seem so lost in our delusions at times that we forget how reliant on them we are in the first place. Most, if not all of what we believe, is naught but a fiction. In the abstract view of this lowly writer, that's me. Every book out there is the vicarious suicide of its author. Let the art speak for itself. In the end, what does it matter to a species that upholds mythology at all costs? Or is even at the mercy of it? All that can happen now is that one foul, humiliating sin will be piled on another, and my sufferings will become only the more acute. I want to die. I must die. Living itself is the source of sin. In some sense, the overall conclusion including the title in both Japanese and English, is contradictory, and therefore as humanistic as one can truly ever hope for it to be. Obe Yozo declares himself disqualified as a human being within a story that has no actual plot and no conclusive end. How many of us could lay claim to never feeling lost, isolated, alone, and utterly clueless as to where we are going. Who of us, unless perhaps by our own hand, knows how each of our lives is going to end? What, I therefore ask you, could be more human? Hello. <laughs> um, I kind of just wanted to show that I haven't completely lost my mind um, and to say thank you for reaching the end of the video. Um, I can only assume that you have watched it all <laughs> and that's why you're here now, although there is a chance you just skipped, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, there are a couple of things actually that I wanted to kind of mention during the whole essay or analysis or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I couldn't really figure out where to add it. And most of the time it was kind of for comedic relief. Um, and I kind of, well, hogged that for myself, I suppose, in the end. Um, but yeah, I think there's a few additional things. So I'm just going to do that now and then I'll be off. Um, so yeah. Um, what do I want to... Yeah. Um, what should I start with? Well, as it's here, um, Yukio Mishima, um, who wrote Confessions of a Mask, which I do recommend as well, and the title alone should kind of give you a slight hint as to why I'm mentioning him, 
because he was very indebted to Dazai and admired him to the point of hatred, actually. Um, he was almost bitter about probably his fame during his lifetime, but also just how huge he really was. Um, and it was during some event, um, and this is what I wanted to mention, so I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing it a little, but there was some kind of event going on for Dazai, and Yukio Mishima actually went along, and he went up to him, and I think he was even dressed in similar clothing, or perhaps there was some sort of traditional Japanese clothing that they were supposed to don, the guests of honour, and he kind of replicated that. And he went up to him and went, I hate your literature. And Dazai just coolly replied, and yet, here you are. <laughs> and uh, I just thought that was a great bit of trivia. Hopefully it's true. Um, and I thought it was pretty badass, to be honest, as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, if anyone who's read this will know what I'm talking about, especially the beginning. I mean, the whole structure is almost to the point of identical. You know, it's kind of like he's, he starts off as a kid. He's quite... Um, a weak child as well, so that doesn't help him too much. And in general, um, the style, although I don't think it's like, it's it's not plagiarism by any means. Mishima actually has his own style and it's really good. His prose is arguably better, but in terms of storytelling and in terms of what the progress of the story, I would definitely recommend um, Dazai over Mishima, but the two are both brilliant. Um, also, Suji Tsushima, who was Dazai, as I mentioned in the video, he did have a daughter, um, I think only one, but I, I'm remembering some trivia that he might have had more, but I'm pretty sure it was only one, or at least it's, it's one worth mentioning here, because, uh, yeah, apologies for the noise. Um, and yeah, her name was Yuko Tsushima, and she became a writer. Um, and she, I've read this one, Territory of Light. Um, I did enjoy this actually quite a lot. And I wanted to mention it alongside Sylvia Plath's kind of <laughs> brief cameo in the video, um, mainly because the story is quite similar. It's about a woman who has just kind of got in, just sort of got into a divorce. Um, and although she didn't initiate it, she's been left with her kid, who's quite young, I think five or something, her daughter, and she's basically having to navigate that and to find a place to live and to look after her, and she kind of just has these moments where she's she's losing the plot, basically, um, and she's very dissociated, and it's quite, quite hard-hitting at times because it kind of hits you out of nowhere, and you're not really sure when to expect it, but it happens, and... Yeah, I thought it was a really good little read, and I thought it was a nice addition as well to the kind of story of Dazai. And, yeah, what are the other things? Um, there was an article that I've added to the description. You can find all the kind of citations and research in there. Um, uh, she was called Lucy Zhang, um, and she wrote an article, and it kind of talked about the Haikiki Mori. Um, it's a kind of well, phenomenon in Japan that has been around for, I think, at least 20 years, perhaps longer. And we've already had a bit of a taste of it, actually, during the last year or so now, um, because of lockdown. Um, and this, this is basically where a lot of teenagers, mostly, and mostly male, lock themselves in their rooms and they just refuse to participate in anything to do with society, which is quite relatable for me. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, I thought it was an interesting article. I wanted to try and squeeze it into the video, but there was not really any opportunity to do so. Um, and Lucy Zhang mentions how Dazai almost kind of predicted it in a very kind of um, inadvertent way. There's a few passages throughout the piece where um, Ozo talks about how anxious he feels by just getting on the tram or having to buy tickets at an office or whatever or a station and yeah it really kind of you can definitely see her point um, and I wanted to add it in but there wasn't really any space in the end um, but yeah I'm mentioning it here so that kind of makes up for it I suppose and yeah there was another article by Eugene Thacker who was obviously I'm not sure you can see this but 
there we go, in the dust of this planet. He is the author of, um, and he wrote a piece about Dazai and about how many times he attempted suicide and what his life was kind of like. And I thought that kind of inspired me, I suppose, to a certain extent. Um, and yeah, it's worth checking out. I think it's on the Japan Times dot com. I'm not sure, but the you know the link is in the description. And also with that one, if you leave the tab open, I noticed that the site wanted you to subscribe and all this bullshit, um, and that was annoying. So um, I actually I had to kind of copy and paste it after I left it on there for a few days. So yeah, keep in mind that's a way around it if you uh yeah if you want to keep it or whatever, um and yeah additionally I can't think of anything else right now, but it was fascinating to really dive into this and I hope you enjoy this new style of video. Um, I don't want to say they're all going to be similar to this because I don't think I'm going to have access to well a whole anime series and a Junji Ito manga kind of um, artwork or anything like that. So I'm kind of going with um, what I can with each piece, but I also do want to include things at, such as uh, computer games, manga, um, sometimes other types of media or perhaps even just kind of theoretical kind of opinion based stuff maybe even looking into somebody's manifesto or something like that i'm not really sure at the moment but i'm i'm going to give each video its own kind of approach and its own take um and i think it should be pretty cool um it will take me a bit longer it won't take me as long as this one did uh what i didn't realize when i chose to do no longer human um and that was just over roughly over the new year um, I knew I needed to learn Adobe and to start getting better at producing videos. But what I didn't kind of realize was how much No Longer Human was actually going to affect me. Um, and yeah, I realized due to its canonical nature, I just had, there was so much to say about it. And I could have probably made this video four or five hours long if I really dived into each notebook. Um, and yeah, it, <laughs> it, it ended up making or yeah, making this take a lot longer than I thought it was going to do. Um, but, you know, we got there in the end. Um, I'm pretty happy with it overall. I'm sure I won't be in a few months, but that's just the nature of creation, I'm, sadly. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's it. Um, anyway, thanks a lot again, and I'll see you soon. If you have any requests, I'd still like to take them. And I might do videos, you know, featuring what I've read over the last month or two, just kind of like the old style, but just kind of talking about each one. Um, because I have read quite a bit, actually, um, not to mention those two again, but also another Mishima, um, The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea. Actually, I did enjoy that a lot. Uh, Straw Dogs by John Gray. Um, I'm currently reading, where is it? Because I'm going to get the title mixed up. There are Any Day You Can Die by Tommy Waite, um, which is really cool. Um, there's there's others, but I'm forgetting the titles right now. But yeah, that's it. Um, this has gone on longer than I intended, so I'm going to scoot. And, well, let me know what you think. Thank you very much. Bye.